right? So we are uh, very excited to have Anna kick off uh, the symposium. Um, Anascape is professor of radio astronomy at the Journal Bank Center for Astrophysics uh, at the University of Manchester and at Turing AI uh, And uh, she will talk about foundation models um, in astrophysics. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to come and talk today. So, um, yes, when um, when Sid invited me, he said, can you talk about foundation models in astrophysics? And then for the program, it also said successes in astrophysics, <laughs> which is a slightly more challenging topic, and I'll, I'll explain. Um, but uh, briefly, what I'm, what I'm hoping to talk about today is why astrophysics is interested in foundation models, or why it should be interested in foundation models. Um, since I'm up first, I thought I would clarify what I mean by a foundation model, because I think that there is still a bit of, um, not disagreement, but foundation models mean different things to different people. Certainly some people seem to associate them almost entirely with language models. Um, so I'm going to clarify that, and then I can clarify what we mean by success, because that in itself is a very subjective um, term, and really what I'm going to um, touch on there are some of the challenges that we need to overcome in astrophysics, including scaling challenges and implementation challenges around the development of foundation models. Then I'm going to um, put my Bayesian pedantry hat on and talk about uncertainty in foundation models and its importance for astrophysics. Um, and then I'm going to briefly touch on multimodality um, with reference to the future outlook or my, my thoughts on the future outlook here. Um, so I'm primarily a radio astronomer. I work a lot on a project called the Square Kilometre Array, which is going to be the world's next biggest radio telescope. Um, it's in fact two telescopes, as you can see here. I'm not going to go into the astrophysics of it because it's not the purpose of this talk. But what I did want to point out is that these two telescopes that we're building are not just an astrophysical facility. They are also a big data machine. So the data rate out of the front end of these telescopes is about 10 to 20 terabits per second. And that's the compressed, that's already compressed at this stage. If we took all of the raw data from the low frequency array, which is the one you can see at the bottom there, we'd be talking about five zettabytes of data per year. So astrophysics really is big data science. In fact, we of course compress that data down even further. Um, so the SKA, when it's fully operational, which will be in a, a few years' time, will be producing around 600 petabytes of data per year in compressed data products. And that's not the full capacity of the telescope, that's just for key science. So we're quickly going into the exascale. Other missions in astrophysics are approaching the same levels. And of course, this is not unique to astronomy. Um, you can see that also across the other physical sciences, in particular particle physics, um, will be approaching the same scales on a very similar time scale. And data volume aside, the information in those data contains hundreds of millions to billions of individual astrophysical systems. And that information is contained not just in images, which is what people think of traditionally for astronomy, but it is inherently multimodal. We take images, we take spectrum, we take polarization data, we take time series. There's a lot of different data in there. And so, of course, astrophysics, like everyone else, is very interested in the development of artificial intelligence in order to automate the processing that we've been doing in much more mundane ways because what we're doing at the moment just simply doesn't scale to these kinds of data volumes. If we want to extract scientifically meaningful information from our data on any kind of reasonable time scale for the new generation of astrophysical observatories, we need we need artificial intelligence to support that. Um, however, it's not simply a, a, a plug and play problem. We can't just take um, results from computer science literature and implement them for astrophysics. If you try that, as we have, it does not work. Um, and I think this is true for most domain specializations. Some of the challenges that we face in astrophysics from a CS perspective are that we have large archival databases, we're getting more and more data, but we only have a comparatively small volume of labeled data. So supervised learning is actually problematic for us. We have significant and variable class imbalances in our data. And the thing to bear in mind um, specifically around this for astrophysics is that perhaps unlike any other field in physics, astrophysics is a field that's based entirely on inference. We can never go back and change 
the underlying parameters of the source that is producing the information that we're receiving. Um, so when we take new observations, we are by definition probing a new distribution of data to the data that we already have in our archives. Um, so um, generalization is a big problem for us. And one of the particular data set shifts we see is prior probability shifts in our data analysis. Um, we do need to be statistically robust. So we need carefully calibrated uncertainties on all of our AI outputs. And I'll put the word calibrated in there specifically. And we also need to be able to understand the biases that get introduced by our AI models. We spend a lot of time in astrophysics understanding the selection biases that are introduced by the instrumentation that we use. If we add an AI model on top of that, we need to be very aware of what the selection biases are that we're introducing through the use of that AI as well. So we need a quantitative estimate of that in order to be able to compare robustly with simulation. So I'm not going to talk about all of these because I don't have days. Um, so I'm primarily going to talk about this one because I think this is the most relevant for um, discussion around foundation models because foundation models are, in my view, driven primarily by large unlabeled data volumes. The, the, the useful use of, of large unlabeled data volumes. So with that in mind, um, I just want to clarify what I think of when I think of a foundation model. So for me, a foundation model is typically um, a model that is trained on a large unlabeled data set, usually using self-supervised learning, there are caveats to that, to produce a, um, a representation that can then be used for multiple downstream tasks that have specific scientific purposes. Um, the other big advantage of these models that I see for astrophysics is the fact that once you have that foundation, you can then fine tune it using much smaller labeled data set in order to address a specific um, downstream task that has a supervised nature. And typically what you find is that the fine tuned performance is much better than the fully supervised performance of just a small labeled data set on its own. Um, and I'll demonstrate that in the uh, in a few slides time. Um, however, I have said that this is a, these are typically self-supervised models. They don't have to be. In principle, you could use some kind of weekly supervised model or a model that has such a broad range of um, learning outcomes that actually provides the same kind of context that self-supervised models use. And uh, one example of this is the Zoobot model. So this is trained on the Galaxy Zoo database, this is an optical database of different types of galaxies. Um, here is a picture of the galaxy. Um, so Galaxy Zoo is a, um, a model that's trained on about order 100,000 galaxies, but uses about 10 million labels on those galaxies. And those labels are provided as the answers that multiple different questions asked the citizen scientists about these galaxies. Um, and it's trained to jointly learn the outcome to about 200 upstream tasks. And it, it learns joint probability distributions over these, these outcomes. And it builds its representation doing that. And on the right-hand side there, you can see a sort of a graphical uh, representation of that updated representation compressed using dimensionality reduction to show you that it is grouping together galaxies of different morphological types. Um, into different areas of the representation space. Now, this model on its own can be asked to be can be used to query um, different aspects of galaxy morphology that are relevant to astrophysical um, analyses. But as a foundation model, it can also be used um, for fine tuning to answer questions about data that are, is not um, currently uh, available in the training data set. So, one specific example of this. Um, is looking for quite a rare type of galaxy called a ring galaxy, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a star forming galaxy with a ring of emission around it that isn't a spiral, it's just a, a ring. You can see some examples up there on the right. Um, and uh, what was found was that using this pre training, provide the foundation from Galaxy Zoo, massively improves the accuracy for identifying ring galaxies in this data set above uh, straightforward uh, supervised classification 
you can see on the left hand side there supervised classification of the black line. So that's the scratch model in terms of the number of labeled examples in that supervised class, uh, classification um, against different types of pre training with the Zubot model. Um, and of course, the, the blue lines at the top are really what we're, we're looking at. That is the, the full pre trained model. Um, the other interesting thing to note here, it, which I'll come back to a bit later, is that there's also a comparison there to a pre training using ImageNet. And this is important for astrophysical foundation models is how you uh, or what you use for your pre-training data and and domain specific data, data does become important here. Now this kind of pre-training using a multiple ask problem is limited as many uh, problems supervised problems are in astrophysics by data. And this reflects how well we can scale our models in astrophysics. So I'm sure most people are familiar with the, with the, the standard scaling relations, the nice log linear relations that are seen for language models and division models um, that show that performance improves um, in a log linear fashion with data volume, computing, and number of model parameters. Now for astrophysical data, we see a similar thing with uh, data volume. So this is some work that I've been involved in recently looking at the um, scaling of different uh, model architectures as a function of data volume. And you can see that, that we're seeing a nice scaling with data volume. Um, this is shown as a, a function of, of different architectures here. However, if we look at the same scaling across the number of model parameters, we see that it saturates at quite a low level. In fact, it's actually, we find that our training, uh, so we find our test loss um, saturates at around about 100 million parameters. And the reason for this is that we simply don't have enough data. So if we're talking about astrophysical data sets, they are an order of magnitude, two, two orders of magnitude smaller than the big image net data sets, for example. And so the advantage of training very large models isn't there in astrophysics. What's happening, um, and we've demonstrated this, is that they, the models just overfit at this point. And so whilst your training loss might drop, your, your test loss doesn't. Um, and so this is a limitation for any kind of label training in astrophysics. I should say that this was done with a data set, which in total has about, about a million um, astrophysical images, which is the largest astrophysical data set, labeled astrophysical data set by a long way. However, that relative ratio between the astrophysical data sets and the terrestrial data sets used for benchmark of the big models is never gonna change we're always going to be orders of magnitude off. Um, so scaling up our models um, in a supervised sense is never going to be that big an advantage for astrophysics, um, which is where self-supervised learning really starts to um, look very, very attractive for astrophysics because we have a much, much larger volume of astrophysical data without any kind of annotations attached to it. So if we go back to the uh, fine-tuning problem, looking for ring galaxies with the Zubot pre-training, what we find is that you can, if you add in a self-supervised um, component here, you can use a much larger number of galaxies. So we've gone from order 100,000 galaxies to order a million um, straight away. And this was some time ago, we can increase this massively now. Um, and that contrastive, uh, so we used a contrastive self-supervised learning algorithm here, and it doesn't improve the final um, test accuracy, but what it does do is it makes the accuracy at smaller numbers of uh, fine-tuning data set samples um, increase faster. So on the right-hand side, you can see the linear probe accuracy for the scratch model, is shown in black just for comparison, and then uh, that's on my screen. Um, the orange model is the standard Zubot pre-training, and then adding in a hybrid contrastive component is the green model. So the fully contrastive model is shown in blue, but this is a linear probe, not fine-tuned accuracy, so that's why it's a bit lower. Um, but immediately, the contrastive uh, self-supervised learning is allowing us to use a larger data set and improving um, the downstream 
accuracy. So this ability to incorporate unlabeled data is very important for astrophysics. And this is shown in the context of optical data, which is the kind of data that you can show to citizen scientists and ask them questions about. It's very visual, um, it relates a lot to what we think of in astronomy. If you move to other data sources in astrophysics or other modalities of astrophysical data, you can't do the same kind of thing. You need a certain level of domain expertise in order to provide, provide any kind of annotation on those data. And that becomes increasingly expensive because there's a finite number of astronomers in the world. Um, and you know, they have other things to do as well. So uh, to give you an example of this, this is, um, this is a, a, a survey field, a radio astronomy survey, um, which is taken with the LOPAR telescope. And to sort of to summarize what you're seeing in this image, every bright point that you can see in that circle is a supermassive black hole. But they are not all the same. And you can see that there are some, some zoom-ins there where you can see that there are specific morphologies associated with these objects. So these are not optically visible. This is what you're seeing here is synchrotron radiation um, produced by the, the highly relativistic gas around these, these supermassive black holes. And it produces these different patterns. And in particular, I wanted to focus on the two that you can see on the right-hand side, where we have jets of radio emission emerging from the, the central supermassive black hole. Now they look quite pretty, very nice, but they're also important. The morphology of these objects is important. And if you asked a radio astronomer what they were looking at here on the right-hand side, they would say, oh, the top one is the Fanarup Riley class two radio galaxy, and the bottom one is the Fanarup Riley class one radio galaxy. And that distinction is important for models of galaxy evolution and for models of um, black hole evolution as well. So, we need an AI to be able to do that kind of level of interpretation of these data. However, we don't have the same kind of annotated data set that you have in optical astronomy from Galaxy Zoo. So in this case, we need a fully self-supervised model um, because you, know, you just can't ask radio astronomers to sit down and look at um, images of radio galaxies to provide a million annotations. We actually worked it out, and a single radio astronomer can annotate about 120,000 radio galaxies a year if that was their full time job. Um, so, really, it doesn't scale. Um, so, one of the most popular forms of self supervised learning uh, for foundation models is contrasted models. So, these are models that are view based, they look at uh, different augmentations of the same input data. Um, I would split the two main forms of self-supervised learning in my own head um, for foundation models into view-based and masking-based models. And I'll come back to why I'm not talking about masking-based models quite yet later on. Um, but for radio galaxies, you can build a foundation model using view-based self-supervised learning, and that's what we did. Um, this is the, the EYOL model, which was SOTA at the time when we built this. And um, even if you do this, using BYOL, you have to be a bit careful in astrophysics. So not all of the augmentations that you would use in a standard BYOL implementation work well for astronomy data. In fact, some of them will completely destroy your performance. And we had to perform a full ablation study on all of the augmentations and actually introduce our own astrophysically motivated augmentations in order to, to make this work. Um, and I will touch back on the um, importance of augmentation and its relation to likelihood and specification in phase and interpretation of these models later on. Um, but if you do this, you can build that kind of latent representation for radio astronomy and do something that it would take decades for astronomers to do by eye. Um, so this is the latent representation for the um, for a large radio galaxy data set here. Again, we're talking order of 100,000 training samples here. Um, and again, this uh, representation has been uh, reduced in dimensionality using PCA and UMAP. Now, one of the interesting things that you can see in these foundation model representations is that they do tend to structure themselves with respect to the physical and observational parameters um, of the data. And this has been seen, this is not specific to this BYOL model, this has been seen before 
um, by a number of groups looking at the use of self-supervised learning in, in astrophysics. And I just um, put a few references at the bottom there, um, two for optical and then one for radio at the end. Um, in this instance, what you're seeing in the, co the colour coding is the angular extent of the source on the sky. Um, so this is not information that was provided to the model, the model was just given images. Um, the kinds of things that you can do with this representation, I'll give you an example of some of the downstream tasks that we're looking at, are that we can do that classification of our radio galaxies into their different types. So for um, the Van Rupp Riley types that I mentioned before, we have a small label data set of order of thousand samples, and you can see it overlaid on the representation or encoded through the model here on the left in orange. So the mirror best data set is our labeled data set, um, and the blue points are the, um, the pre-training representation. None of the orange data points were included in the pre-training data. Um, and you can see that the, the uh, foundation model representation is significantly more extensive than our labeled data set, which is what we want. We want that kind of context to answer in the problem. And what we see is that with the, the pre-training from the, the BYOL model, our test error is reduced um, by a statistically significant amount, in particular from very small numbers of labeled data points. And that's what I'm showing you on the right hand side here. Now, one of the interesting things about this label data set is that the human annotators who labeled it, the two radio astronomers, they actually put in a qualification on each of the galaxies about whether they were confident or uncertain about their labels. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the confident data, but the same um, improvement actually holds for the uncertain data, in fact, to a degree that we were very surprised by because we actually expected there to be more label noise in the annotations than, than in fact the model showed. So this is an example of a fine-tuned downstream task. Um, a direct use of the representation is similarity searching. Um, this has been used in, in other applications of, of uh, self-supervised models in astrophysics. Here what we've done is we've encoded a very rare type of radio galaxy through the model. That's the one on the left, uh, top left. They're highlighted in pink. So this is a hybrid radio galaxy. It has a Van Rupp Riley morphology on one side and a Van Rupp, sorry, Van Rupp Riley type one morphology on one side and a Van Rupp Riley type two morphology on the other side. And by encoding it through the model and using the cosine similarity in latent space, we can extract out a sample of these types of these rare types of galaxies. And that's what you're seeing in the other uh, uh, images there. And as far as we know, this is the first time that anyone's put together a sample of these galaxies because they're so difficult to identify in data sets because they are so rare. A third downstream task that is increasingly important for us using new facilities is cross-survey classification. So the ability to use our foundation model, which is trained on archival data, to improve our performance um, on new data. So this new data, as I mentioned, will suffer this generalization gap issue because the observational parameters will be different, the sensitivity will be different, the resolution will be different. And so we're, by definition, probing a different distribution of target data. Um, so our target for cross-survey classification in this case was data from the Meerkat telescope. So our model was trained on data from the VLA telescope in New Mexico using a historic survey that was actually made in the 1990s. Um, the Meerkat data was produced last year using the, the Meerkat telescope in South Africa, which is um, the precursor to the Square Kilometer Array Mid Frequency Array. And on the right hand side, you can see that one of the survey fields for Meerkat, which is showing their new data. And again, pretty much every bright spot you can see in that field is a supermassive black hole. So, uh, balance of galaxies in these data is different to the VLA to data. And again, uh, pre-training on our VLA data and then our application to uh, the Meerkat data improves our performance by a significant amount. Um, so in fact, having this kind of um, trained foundation is incredibly important for extracting information from new surveys. Um, and one thing I would say about the Meerkat data is that there were no labeled data sets for this telescope. So we actually had to create a labeled data set enabled 
be able to validate this, this result. Um, so one of the uh, things that we have found uh, is that, or well, one of the things you may have noticed about what I've been presenting is that in both the optical and the radio case, our pre-training is done on astronomy data. So we are using an in-domain pre-training data set. And a question that we are asked um, quite often is, is why do you bother doing that? Why not just pre-train on ImageNet like everyone else does? Um, and the answer is that astronomy data is different to terrestrial data. And there are a number of reasons why it's different. Um, I will highlight one in particular um, in the next few slides. But we can also demonstrate quantitatively that actually pre-training on our intermate data has a very big effect on our downstream performance. And that's what I'm showing you here. So these are five different downstream tasks from the Zubot model. So that's the optical data. Um, and blue bars are showing you the performance on ImageNet pre-training, and the orange bars are showing you the performance using astrophysical intermain data for pre-training as well. Um, and you can, I mean, you can see by eye that the difference is significant. As it, and not only is it significant, but it also differs depending on the downstream task. And this, again, is important in terms of one of the, the, the worries that I had about the use of foundation models, which is how do you understand the predicted prior that's coming from that foundation? So just to highlight um, one of the ways in which astronomy data is different and how that relates to foundation models specifically or training of foundation models specifically, I wanted to talk about the other kind of self-supervised learning that's, that's often used. And this is the use of mass autoencoders. Um, so mass autoencoders work by uh, extracting different patches from images, training an encoder, um, and then uh, learning a decoder that reconstructs the entire image as well uh, in a loop. So just to, to give an example of this using MNIST on the right hand side, see for these three numbers, the original images, the masked images that go into the MAE, um, and the reconstruction made from this model. Um, and this works very nicely, right, as you can see. However, what we found is that when you put radio galaxy images into this, it doesn't work very nicely. Um, and we discovered this mainly when we were looking at the BYOL um, training. So in the BYOL results that I showed you, that's using a ResNet backbone. We wanted to use a vision transformer backbone, but we were worried we didn't have enough data. Um, and so we thought, well, we'd use a, a mass image modeling approach, and that should be, uh, that should support the use of the BIT. Um, but in fact, it, it doesn't work at all. And one of the reasons is the, uh, the degree of, well, the distribution of information in the astronomical images. Um, so in the MNIST images, you can see that the numbers occupy most of the space. Now, I don't mean in terms of the pixels that are illuminated, but the you know, the volume of the image that they're, that are occupying. The radio galaxies are much more semantically sparse than their images. They tend to be concentrated in a very small area. So in terms of their frequency representation, the information is, exists at much higher frequencies. Um, and you can look at this also using the MNIST data. So if we scale down those MNIST um, images, perform the same masking and try to reconstruct you. You don't get back something sensible. And this is not something that no one else has noticed. This has been noticed in the literature. Um, but we think that we can explain it. Um, and this was inspired actually from radio interferometry and the way that radio interferometers work, looking at the frequency space representations of the images. Um, so the smaller scale information in the images is contained in the high Fourier terms or the, the, the high frequency Fourier modes, and those are lost when you use the mass auto encoder. Um, however, uh, Mike Bowles recently developed um, this alternative approach to work with radio images, um, which performs the masking in frequency space. So this is a frequency mass auto encoder. And in this case, what you can do is you can recover the information on those small scales. So it works 
in a very similar way to the standard NAE, except that you Fourier transform your data and you mask it in Fourier space and then you reconstruct against the Fourier transform. And this allows you to reconstruct very compact information in your, your images. So here are those, those MNIST numbers again, scaled down even further. And the reconstruction using the, the Fourier mass force encoder is extremely good. And this is an approach that we developed specifically for uh, dealing with radio galaxy images. You can <clears throat> see that effect on the performance across a range of different scaling factors. So one here is the original MNIST scale, then as it goes smaller, it's shrinking MNIST down. And you can see that the uh, standard mass autoencoder approach actually drops off a cliff at a scaling factor of about, of about 0.2. Um, and you can explain this mathematically actually through the combinatorics of the map pixels in the image. Um, and you can see it using Monte Carlo realizations. Um, so then the final thing I wanted to talk about is uncertainty. Um, one of the points that I, I made early on in this, this presentation was that one of the things that astrophysics needs from AI are well calibrated uncertainties. And one thing that is very difficult to get from deep learning models are well calibrated uncertainties. Um, and that is particularly true in the case of foundation models. Um, so just to, to motivate this a little bit, I wanted to talk about the posterior predictions that you get from just the supervised models that you use. So for a radio galaxy model, a supervised case, looking at that classification, Banner of Riley, class one or class two, um, there are different ways of introducing um, or of providing posterior distributions from your deep learning model. So one of the most widely used is Emerson dropout, because it's one of the most easily implemented. Um, but of course, there are more rigorous approaches. So what I'm showing you here are for a trained model at test time, uh, putting the same test sample through the model 200 times and looking at the distribution of softmax outputs. So we have softmax class one, softmax class two, and you can see the distribution of the outputs for empty dropout is very narrow, which you might think is very good because it suggests that there's very little variance in the output. But unfortunately, empty dropout can be very, very confident and very, very wrong at the same time. Um, and you see that when you look at the calibration of the uncertainties that it provides. And by calibration, I mean, in the simplest case, the uh, number of misclassifications for a different level of uncertainty and the posterior, different level of variance in the posteriors. So uh, variational inference is another approach to this where you put variational approximations over all the parameters in your model. And for exactly the same model, exactly the same data, exactly the same test sample, this is the kind of posterior you get out of your softmax uh, values. Now, one of the issues that we found with variational inference in radio astronomy is what's referred to in the, the, the CS literature as the cold posterior effect. I would probably refer to it as model misspecification, but we see that we have to temper the complexity term in our album in order to actually um, get good performance out of our models. And so there are various reasons why this might be the case. Um, one of which, so it could be the prior, could be the likelihood, could be the posterior. So to test the posterior, the only way you can really check what the posterior looks like is to add in some uh, MPMC. So again, same model, same data, same sample. This is what the HMC posterior looks like. Um, and you can see that all of these methods give you different results. Now, HMC is what you want, right? It's, it's probably the only, the only good baseline, but the computational expense of running HMC for anything approaching a foundation model is just unreasonable. So having a, some kind of Bayesian approximation that works and is well calibrated is actually quite important. Um, and that, uh, this is not something that just um, astronomers are interested in. The literature is looking at a variety of different Bayesian and approximations to keep learning. Our experience is that they all give you different answers. Uh, so this is uh, a table showing the performance and the uncertainty calibration for the HMC at the top and then a variety of different Bayesian approximations below it um, for the same 
problem that I just showed you. Now, there's an interest, there are some interesting things in there. Um, for the BI and HMC, I'm showing the results without data augmentation and with data augmentation. Um, the uh, last layer, the class dropout ensembles of that you have to have augmentation on this train. What you can see in this is that the, the BI and HMC tend to be quite well calibrated in terms of the, the uncertainty calibration. Um, if you get down into the um, sort of the, the more brutal approximations at the bottom, they are not well calibrated. And this is probably because of the way that they're trained, that they're being trained with the negative log likelihood and not with the full elbow. Um, and so the uh, energy surface is not being recovered correctly. However, we do see this cold posterior effect in our VI models. Um, which we still cannot explain um, completely. I'm just showing you what that looks like um, on the right-hand side. So this is the uh, model performance as a function of the temperature parameter, uh, which is the regularization we have to introduce to the complexity term in our elbow in order to, uh, to train these models. So we know that this is specific to the VI because if you use HMC, it goes away. So it is not, as one paper, I read because Bayes' formula is wrong. <laughs> um, but it is something to do with the BI approximation in, in deep learning. So um, we have found that we cannot explain this through different prior choices. Augmentation does not make a difference. So, which is in contrast to some other applications where they have found that data augmentation has introduced likelihood misspecifications. That's not a problem for us. Um, our posterior approximation, which is Gaussian, everyone's posterior approximation, appears to be sound. Our HMC posteriors are all Gaussian as well. We're in Gaussian um, We have tried the pack based approach that should account for different levels of model misspecification in the posterior. Um, and we're now at the point where we're looking at whether the optimizer, whether basically stochastic gradient descent has worked very well with BI and deep learning, um, or our model is misspecified at the level that we're asking the wrong question. Um, so this is uh, something that we are actively looking at and actually don't have an answer for. And it's important not only for the calibration of the uncertainties on the individual predictions, but perhaps more importantly for astrophysics, it's important for identifying anomalies in your data. So one of the things that is very important for astrophysics is the ability to detect new things. So almost every astrophysical facility that's been built over the last 50 years became famous not for the thing it was designed to do, but for the thing it discovered by expanding that parameter space. And so when we implement AI models into our analysis, we have to be very, very careful not to automate out that potential discovery. Um, so one of the ways that we've been looking at this is, is how the models, different Bayesian approximations respond to different degrees of um, uh, distribution shift in our, in our test data. So what I'm showing you here is the, um, uh, the Gibbs free energy for um, different test samples, which is um, one way of identifying uh, whether your model is um, seeing something that's in distribution or not, um, across a range of different data sets. So the, the Miravest data set, that's the VLA data in, the, in New Mexico, that is our training data, that's our in distribution data, that's our radio galaxies. We're also introducing two other data sets here. The first of these is data from the Meerkat telescope in South Africa. So this is in distribution in the sense that the objects in the data are radio galaxies, but it's out of distribution in the sense that they are observed with a different telescope, so the observational parameters are different. The third data set we have is the uh, galaxy MNIST data. These are optical images. They contain completely different astrophysical structures from what you would find in the radio data. So they are out of distribution in more ways, if you like. Um, and on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is the distribution of the free energy for these different samples at test time. So this is through the trained model. And the objection, the, the objective 
of uh, looking at these values is to see if we can separate out these different degrees of data set shift in our test sample, see which ones are, you know, out of distribution. Um, and what we found is that, in fact, the HMC is the only approach that allows us to make these separations based on threshold P, for example, um, which is which is quite um, disappointing. So for all of the other approximations, what we find is that there's significant overlap between the, the outputs of the models. Um, and so we would have to um, accept a particular level of, you know, um, misspecification, um, but the level of misspecification depends on the approximation that we would be using. Okay. Um, so the final thing that I just wanted to touch on right at the end, I've been talking about foundation models built in a single modality of data, which is image data. Um, of course, foundation models in principle can use multiple modalities of data and embed them into the same representation space. Um, and there is one example of this that I'm aware of so far in astrophysics, which is the AstroClip model. So AstroClip works like Clip. So Clip has images and text. AstroClip has images and spectra. Um, and it embeds them into the, the same shared embedding space. Um, and then in principle, you perform downstream tasks using that AstroClip model. So one of the downstream tasks that they, they looked at here is the most, uh, I think, scientifically interesting of the downstream tasks that they looked at with this model was extracting the redshift information from individual data samples. So redshift is basically telling us how far away the galaxy is from us. Um, and you can recover that redshift information using spectra directly, um, but getting spectra is very expensive in terms of instrument time. So if you could train the model to give you back the redshift accurately um, based on image data, then that would be extremely valuable. Um, so if you can develop a joint foundation based on images and spectra, and then use zero shot probe using an image to return a redshift, that would be the, the scientific objective. Um, so these are, the, these are the results from this, this model. Um, I've highlighted in yellow that, that top line there. So uh, these R squared values basically higher is better. One is one is bottom. Um, the one I've highlighted in yellow there is the standard method for recovering, well, is for recovering redshifts if you don't have spectra, um, which is to use the photometry and then some kind of uh, regression models. So they've used an MLP. Um, a lot of um, observatories just use the nearest neighbor. Um, approach. I'm going to remove the spectrum embeddings because I think that's cheating um, and just look at the, the image embeddings. And actually what we can see is that the shared embedding space actually doesn't provide a massive advantage over just having the, the photometry. The photometry can be extracted from the images as it is. So um, at the moment, I think this is telling us that we're not seeing a massive improvement in the in the um, ability of foundation models trained in a multimodal way in astrophysics. Now, that's not to say that um, that won't come in the future, but I have a slight worry that, in fact, the multimodal science cases for astrophysics are so specific that, in fact, the foundation model is not necessarily the best way to go. Um, and Partly, that's because I think that these are slightly forced associations. Um, but secondly, also because how do you recover the uncertainty on those redshifts when you extract them? And those redshifts are critical to a lot of the science that we do. Um, if we don't understand how the uncertainty propagates through the representation from the foundation model, then we can't propagate it into our predicted redshift. Um, and I, I say this not because I don't think it can ever be done. I actually think it's a really interesting problem. Um, understanding how foundation models can provide a predictive prior for the downstream tasks that they're then applied to. But I don't think we know how to do it yet. Um, so this is something that I think uh, astrophysics would be very interested in and is potentially somewhere where we can contribute. Um, so I wanted to come back just to finish off this my conclusion slide. 
to this question, what do we mean by success? Um, and, and the answer is I'm not entirely sure at this point. I mean, success really is the perfect idea of success is that we have a foundation model that allows us to use predictions directly in astrophysical analyses. And I think we're quite a long way from that at this point. Um, so really what I um, put down as my thoughts here are, are how do we get to that point? Um, so I was thinking about how, how do we do this? Who builds these foundation models and, and how do we distribute them? So one of the things that I really do like about foundation models is their ability to democratize the use of large scale AI, particularly through fine tuning onto specific downstream tasks. So not everyone has to build their own foundation model. If there is a foundation model for a specific observatory that is fine tunable via API, that allows its use by a much larger section of the scientific community than would otherwise be able to, um, to access the information and the data that are used to build the foundation model. Because when you've got 600 petabytes of data a year, the average astronomer is not going to download that into their laptop and you know, run their regression on it. So the compression provided by foundation models for um, astrophysical information, I think is very important. However, if you're going to do that, then the people who should be hosting the foundation models, just to own is in, in inverted commas, because I don't think owned is the right word there, but host the foundation model is probably best hosted by the collaborations that also host the data. So for example, the Euclid satellite will have its own archive, and astronomers will use the data from that archive. If the Euclid collaboration also had their own foundation model that was a versioned foundation model against particular data release, with a particular model that allows a wider use of the data, increases the utility of the data for the community, so it speeds up the, the scientific process, but it then also provides traceability, reproducibility, and it embeds the domain expertise of that collaboration into the foundation model. Now, the, um, the reality of that kind of model, though, is that we would probably start building foundation models around specific data sets. So we would not do cross cross astrophysical cross subdomain models, if you like, initially. And I think that's probably the way to go because we have so much learning to do about multimodal foundation models already. It would be silly to just jump straight in there. Um, and then my second point is that the scientific use of these foundation models requires better verification of of their outputs, and that includes uncertainty, generalization gaps, etc. And I've caveated this with the fact that I know that I've talked in a very data-driven way here about the analyses. So one of the areas where I can see these kinds of representations being used much more rapidly is in simulation-based inference um, for interpolation across parameter space, where I think that the use of surrogate models is probably going to be much more interpretable. Um, and easy to use rather than data-driven models. Um, and then, yeah, again, just the, the multimodal use cases, I think we need to think very carefully about these. I suspect that it would, I don't know, waste of time is not, not the, probably not the right phrase, but just throwing all of the data into a giant model and building a big computer to process it. Not sure it's gonna be the most useful for you to do straight up. Um, so these are my, thoughts on foundation models for astrophysics. Um, I'll finish there. I just wanted to quickly thank um, the members of my group whose work I have either shamelessly plugged throughout this talk. Um, and, uh, and, and give their, their respective destinations. But yeah, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Emma. Um, so I feel the owl with the talk is good enough to have sound uh, in the rule. We have uh, a very much time to discuss it. We'll turn this to the end of the person. So uh, if you have a question, please just start uh, if you can do Hi, I'm Fiala Chanhan, theoretical nuclear and particle physics at MIT. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about name specificity. So you hinted at it both with pre-training and a little bit when you talked about frequency space, but how do you see the landscape evolving of exploiting sort of 
the architect is all architectural components designed for other image applications versus maybe designing entirely custom architectures for the types of image data you have? So yes, it's an interesting question. I'd say when I first started looking at this kind of stuff, I was very much in the mindset of uh, let's build a very specific model that does something very specific in a very efficient way for our particular problem. Um, and let's design a custom architecture and you know, do it like that. Um, I think from a reproducibility point of view, it's a nightmare. So I actually, these days, I would probably say to you that using common backbone architectures is the way forward, unless you need something specific like a very massive auto encoder, then I would consider that an add on anyway, right? That's not a bad thing. Um, the other area where it starts to become important, I think, is when you want to encode um, uh, different physical restrictions to your models. I'm trying to say that in the most general sense possible. Um, so one of the things that we looked at is how you would code um, different levels of invariance into your model. For that we mean a specific architectural component. So I wouldn't say you need a specific architecture necessarily. Um, <clears throat> I see that as a another interesting question for the use of foundation models because obviously if you're building a foundation model that's meant a foundation representation that's meant to be very generalizable, then if you start to encode specific restrictions into it, um, how does that then affect the potential downstream traffic that doesn't necessarily also uh, incorporate those same restrictions? If you build those restrictions just fine tuning, for example, then how does the how does the prior from the foundation problem get through that? So I think the development of more physics and form models is something that will be talked about later today. And so maybe I'll leave that question for the other space talks. Thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm intrigued by this result about how you can't preserve your uncertainty as you so so when you look at the kind of you know, penalty agency and the AI. And then you look at, you know, trying to follow the answers, you can't have a couple of them. That's right. And, and I guess you said it wasn't the, I have this personal bias that the augmentation should, should, you know, right. Let me ask two questions. Um, sorry, I didn't think about this. Um, so my first question is that um, I have a personal bias that augmentation should be kind of physically motivated. And I, I often see people just kind of training with kind of augmentations that aren't physically motivated. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about, you know, choice of augmentations. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I share your bias. Um, so I do feel like, I, well, well, so there are two schools of thought, right? So there is this, the school of thought, which I think is in the domain randomization category that says that your augmentation should be completely random whatever you like, and that would help with generalization. In my experience, that is not the case. Um, however, um, having overly specific augmentations, um, we also haven't found it massively useful. Um, from a statistical perspective, there are several works that have looked at um, likelihood and specification in the context of data augmentation, and they find that if you use um, physically unmotivated or um, and most basically in the data context augmentations, then it will affect your likelihood. Um, and they have, there are there are some people who have corrected their posterior effect by removing um, unmotivated augmentations. Yeah, that's certainly the case. Um, I, so I, I do think they have an effect. I do think you have to think carefully about them. Um, I worry more though about data curation than augmentation. So I think if you overly curate your data, you can't over undo that over curation through augmentation. Um, and you shouldn't try to, if that makes sense. So I think that it's better as from a scientific perspective to think about the curation of data um, so that we have larger accurate data sets that are realistic, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so, so so then all right, the, yeah. I and this makes a lot of sense, right? So the point being is, you know, Bayes' theorem, you have to have a prior that's sufficiently large enough to cover as all possible, right? So when you're training, it should be as large as possible, right? Um, 
So then my, my question then is now when you try to extract X or you need to do full kind of parameter estimation, do you I mean I'm 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 trying to wonder if you have any guesses as to why you can't kind of recover everything that you want. Do you mean specifically from the BI? Yeah, so when you compare the yeah. BI, yeah. Yeah, so I um at this point I'm almost convinced that it's actually not problem with our data more than one I think it's a problem with some gas gradient descent method. Yeah. So it's it's just that the, it's not a full gradient descent method. It's yeah. not as robust as MCMC. Yeah, exactly. So there is a new, so we're, we're trying to test this at the moment. There's a new approach to optimization for BI from Ivan. Um, and we're using that as an alternative to SGD, and we're going to see if that has an effect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then you came back as a manager of actually your data and where you're from. Yeah, and then just kind of work with scaling machine learning models. Uh, so I'm, I'm not an expert in foundation models, but it seems from well like a media adoption of that, that you can take some huge one of trade and a huge data set. It's a reason about the uh, huge resources they use for trade. Right? So I just wanted another scale for, for your foundation model. The scale do you kind of buy like, Distribute the age to trade and that uh, kind of give, if you train this model, can you benefit like all these? Or the, can you use, for example, gradient? So, I, um, yeah, so I think, sorry, you asked many questions. Um, so, to do the scaling tests that I showed, uh, if I can see the name, yeah, these kinds of things. So, this took about 15,000, 15,000 GPU hours. Like building these models is expensive. Um, who they benefit, I think, is sub domain specific. So the, the Zubot foundation models potentially, initially, only benefit the, you know, the star forming galaxy on towards running communities. Um, so that foundation model would not be used by radio astronomers, I think. Unless they wanted it as a complementary data set. Um, so I think we don't have a good feeling for this yet. And I do think there is going to be a trade off between um, amount of compute and utility of the model. Um, and we do need to be a bit careful about that because the implications of just training larger and larger models are not sustainable, especially for a community that is funding limited. But yeah, in, in these figures, it's mostly like CNN model, which you can also use that. Well, yeah, no, not not the GPT. Uh, David, uh, and, and by you, um, uh, so I have a very high level question which I don't expect to be able to answer because I really think it's very wide open. Your, your um, talk was very much about very living very much in the data space, you know, similarity. Like, I really like the similarity thing. I can see tons of uses we can do when you find similar. Um, but the fundamental question, the questions of astrophysics are not, you know, classification and sorting. Classification and sorting are all in service of the question of astrophysics, which are things like, how do black holes form and uh, what is the nature of the dark matter? Um, how do you see this connecting? Like, because it, right now there's no way, even if the foundation model was amazingly successful on all fractions, would we in fact learn anything about how black holes form or the nature of the dark matter? So, yes, I completely agree with your point. So I sit in a space where uh, I look at a lot of the science cases for the SKA, and the, um, the scientist who's writing the case says, we will constrain galaxy evolution by looking at the properties of all of the FR2 type galaxies in the SKA surveys. And the question in my mind is, how are you going to know which ones are the FR2 type galaxies, right? Because that piece was missing. So this is really a, looking at the, the AI that replaces the human aspect of that, rather than so the human aspect of astrophysics that has, has historically been done largely by I. Right? So it's it's a it's a robot astronomer, if you like. What you're talking about is how we take the product of that and propagate it into an astrophysical parameter, which has typically been done by a computer. 
So there's AI that replaces people and there's AI that replaces computer programs. Um, and they're two different things. So in terms of the foundation models, yeah, you would probably use a different foundation model. I think, well, would you use a different foundation model? I, so extracting the, so a lot of the problems would be similar because you're going to want robust uncertainty estimates on your astrophysical samples, right? So that has to propagate through. And then whether the foundation model itself, I, yeah, I, it's, it is a high level question. I don't have a, I don't have a precise answer to it. There are a lot of different aspects to it. I would say that I, I'm somewhat skeptical of us learning new physics through foundation models at the moment. Um, and I think this is, this is something that's been debated more widely in terms of I'm talking about that when we talk about learning new physics is emerging properties in foundation models. And even with the language-based models, the huge language-based models, those emerging properties are actually, there's a question about whether they're real or whether they're just function of the way that we evaluate all of those models. And if you changed our evaluation parameters, then you can see that this is not new. Um, in terms of replacing the bit, the, the process that's done by a computer to run an algorithm, I think the AI would be incredibly successful. Um, because uh, for interpolation, for extrapolation, skeptical again, going back to my version of the I don't know if that answers your question. So, so I think have one. Um, so in the end, maybe we're going to use the word astrophysics, which I haven't appreciated. I just say it comes to part of the stuff that I find. Um, so you show that if you take out the, uh, the spectra, actually you don't gain very much uh, by using the multiple subsidization, which I kind of appreciate it. Um, and the photometry does simple well. Do you think that's just because um, there's just like a lot of physics that goes into extracting photometry from the images, um, and that's just like a strong tie or you know maybe there isn't enough data. If you change the more data, actually the uh, more information would be better. Um. So there's not a lot of physics that goes into extraction. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, right? You can integrate over a region or over a piece of spectrum. It's really quite straightforward. So so from that perspective, no. Um, in terms of what the joint embedding is doing, it is doing something because if you look at the result with the Stein image embedding, so that's a straightforward self supervised image embedding, that is very poorly. Like it does, it does comparatively much more poorly than the photometry model. So just having an image embedding is not enough. That that is certainly the case. So having the shared embedding does improve over just having an image embedding, but that should not be a surprise. Right, because just having an image embedding shouldn't necessarily contain any information about spectral properties. Um, so I I think that this is probably just aligning the photometry from the images with the spectral embedding. So it's um, yeah, I think it's perhaps not the best use case to demonstrate the potential. I think there are other astrophysical problems where a joint embedding might be more beneficial. Well, that was thank you.